Welcome to Trojans Taco Tea. My name is Alyssa Concha and I'm here with Rob Russo and we're broadcasting live from the University of Southern California Division of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy. And today we're kicking off a new series of episodes about the dilemmas surrounding disability, which is a very rich and complex topic. I'm very excited about this topic too, by the way, because for the past semester, I've been studying disability with Dr. Ann Neville-Jan, who is one of the people you interviewed for this podcast. Yeah, it's perfect. perfect. But before we really dig deeper into this, let's rewind and talk a little bit about what occupational therapy is in case someone's tuning in interested more in disability and doesn't really know what occupational therapy is. So to me, when I think of occupational therapy, I talk about anything that someone does that is meaningful that occupies their time. That's really what occupation is. So an occupational therapist then works with individuals throughout the lifespan, whether they've had an illness, an injury, or any kind of difficult life circumstances to help them get back to those meaningful occupations, those things that they want to do or would like to do with their time. And so that's what an occupational therapist does. Tell us who you are and what you do. I'm Ann Neville Jan, and I'm the Associate Chair for Faculty and Curriculum at uh, USC in the Division of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy. And I do a lot of things. I, um, I'm an administrator. I oversee all the curriculum and work with faculty. Um, hiring search committees, I teach, and I do a little bit of research. So let's talk about the classes that you teach. What are you teaching this semester? This semester I'm teaching a class called Clinical Reasoning, and it's a class about, it's, it's not so much about what to do in the moment with the patient, but what people, what therapists think about. and. Um, trying to, it, it's about empathy, I'd say, having empathy and using that empathy in treatment. And the other class I teach is called Disability Occupations and Healthcare, and it's taught to undergraduate students who some may be OT, go into occupational therapy, and some may not. So that's an interesting class. I bet, with a lot of different perspectives. Yeah, and they come into my class with a a lot of the stereotypes about disability. Um, You know, that it's a tragedy, it's a horrible thing. Um, Who would want to, everybody who has a disability would want to be cured. Um, And so it's fun to see them change as they learn new perspectives. It's really exciting to see that change. Some, one of my students said, he, I showed a video of um, different people with disabilities who are poets and artists and performers, and they were talking about what it means to have a disability. And um, someone in the class commented, I've never seen so many people at, in one hour. I've seen more people in that one hour who have a disability than I've seen in my whole life. So you can, you know that the class is just all about that. So yeah, that's what's exciting. So maybe this would be a good time to talk about your history and kind of how you got into OT and your experience. Okay. Well, you'd think that, well, I have spina bifida, so that's a congenital, um, uh, issue that occurs in the first three months in the womb. And um, they told my parents I wouldn't walk. I would be developmentally delayed. I'd have my, I have hydrocephalus and all these worst case scenario things. And back in the 1950s, that was, you know, they hadn't developed the shunt. So if I did have hydrocephalus, I was not going to make it. So, um, and 90% of uh, infants born with spina bifida have a shunt. I mean, have a hydrocephalus. So, I was lucky. Um, 
So, so I, you know, one of my mom's friends who had polio said, have your daughter be educated, get as much education as she can. So that's what my parents did. They, they just kept me going in school and, <clears throat> and then I never had occupational therapy. I had physical therapy, but I read about it in a book and it sounded great to combine science and art and that's those were my two interests so I volunteered at a um, at Johns Hopkins in their um, OT department and I loved it I worked with adolescents who were hospitalized because they have they had anorexia and so I helped run a group and that was I loved it so that's how I went into OT Nice. And so when you're teaching your class, you can speak from experience and talk about your personal perspectives on disability. Right. That's, I, I di wasn't always able to do that. It took me time to feel comfortable in my own body and be able to, to talk to students. But in the past, I'd say 15 years, I feel that's something big that I bring to class um, and and I f talk about it freely and it's helped me I I love to teach but part of teaching is also learning so I'm always learning with students and I'm always experiencing new things so so one of the things that came in came up in in our classes is proper terminology you know right. we're talking about a lot of different medical conditions and something that has been really important for some of our professors is using person first language. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask what to you is person first language? Well, I'm I think person first language is that you're a person and then w with a disability. Like I'm first I'm Ann Neville Jan who has spina bifida. Um and I think that for people who haven't experienced a disability or, you know, are going out there in the world, I think it's really important to promote that person first um, because you can get into the habit of calling people their disability, like um, autistic children or... Um, Oh, that total hip replacement in 204. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, it becomes kind of, once you get out there in the clinic, sometimes therapists get, students get socialized into doing that. And I think you don't have to call out other people for what they say, but when they'll hear you say, Joan in, in 206, who has a hip replacement, if you keep saying it, it in person first language, they're going to notice. Mm -hmm. And so so I think we don't always have to feel, oh, I should correct that person, you know, and say not to do that. So I think by example, we can, um, we can show and what, you know, the kind of language that should be used. Um, and I think that's the default. If you're ever not sure, always use person, per, per, person first. Um, Situations where you might not hear person first is in the disability community. Um, people don't care so much in terms of, you know, I'm a disabled person and that's who I am. And it's more of like putting it in people's faces so that they get, you know, recognized. And it's a civil rights issue. And so it's, you know, you might hear that. and. I might say, in some instances, in some venues, I'm a disabled person. But I wouldn't want somebody else to call me a disabled person. <laughs> right. So, so it's, it's not always one way. It's, nothing is ever one way. Right. So I guess talking about, instead of the terminology, the reasoning behind coming up with it is more about recognizing people for who they are Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, their identity includes their disability. Right. But not 
limiting your perception of that person to right. what that disability is or stereotyping a disability because as mm-hmm. we've learned every diagnosis is different from person to person it's right. a case by case basis <laughs> i have a story and um, i went to see a physical therapist and a few months later that physical therapist saw my husband and my husband said to him oh you must know my wife she's um she's a professor in occupational therapy and he thought and thought and he goes i don't think so and he said her name's ann neville jan he thought and thought and thought no i don't i don't think i met her so my husband came home and he said you know he said he didn't know you and i said tell him i had spina bifida so the next time my husband saw the saw the physical therapist he said my wife said you would know her because she has spina bifida and he goes oh yeah i know her (laughs) (laughs) so you know he knew me more because i had spina bifida than who i was as a person right so i thought i thought that was such a really good example yeah and i knew exactly how to get him to remember me yeah i mean Sometimes it's a shortcut. It's a thing that, why can't the most notable thing about me be that I'm a professor in occupational therapy rather than I have spina bifida? Right. Or both. Another thing I wanted to bring up, I mentioned to Tara Perry about this episode and coming to talk to you and she was like, oh, have you guys seen the video of Dr. Neville Jan in the 70s talking about... And I was like, no, (coughs) but... You will. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you maybe briefly, what was it, what what was the video for? Well, um, I was in New York. I was a therapist, and I was at home in the evening watching a TV show. It was NBC News Magazine, and they... It was about spina bifida, and I thought, oh, it perked me up, and I started listening. And there was not one... There was one sentence, and I had an opportunity to see the, the, the clip again, one sentence that a, per, a child with spina bifida can lead a normal and productive life. And the rest was doom and gloom. They talked about how um, the child would have bladder and bowel problems and how at various times this mother had to put a cath tube to drain the urine, the way they describe things, you know. Very dramatic. Yeah, and um, I was horrified. And so I've never done this before. And I wrote a letter and said, I spina bifida, and I think I still have a letter somewhere. And, um, you know, I lead a productive life. I'm an I'm a occupational therapist, and I, you know, went on, and I date, and I did blah, 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 and, and your, your show was very negative about spina bifida. So anyway, it was more than that. So I got a call the next day from the producers, and they asked me if I would, I, since I was in New York, it was easy, if I would come down and, um, you know, at the end of their show, they always have clips of people talking fr- about the previous show, um, their comments. So um, I went I went down, and actually the show was about, it was about spina bifida, but the main theme was that there was now a test in utero to determine if the child had spina bifida. So the idea is that, well, now you can have this test and you can find out And you don't have to have this child child with spina bifida. It's such a tragedy. So anyway, so I went down, and I was nervous. And, you know, they had a camera um, on me and a light. And I had my own person, and she was sitting there with me and asking me to talk about this topic. And she said, you sound, when you're saying this, you're smiling. And she said, aren't you upset about it? And I go, well, yeah, this is kind of my personality. I tend to smile. And she said, well, you know, she really got me into the feeling of, of how, str- like how be strong. Angry. <laughs> yeah, be angry about this. So anyway, so I thought, I worried then about how they would put this clip in with other clips because, you know, what they can do, they can right, range right. it. So 
I actually had the last word. I was there were three or four different people responding, and I'm not going to give it away for you because you'll see it in class. <laughs> and and, um, and so what, what's very dramatic when students see it is that I'm young. I'm 30 years younger, <laughs> and I have curly hair and big earrings, and <laughs> and. Um, but that was my, pr I got on TV and I said, you know, it's fun and bippida and I'm glad my parents didn't have to make this choice. Because that's what the show was called, The Terrible Choice. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that intense? And, and this issue is still going on. Right. People don't think that there's, I sat next to a woman on a plane the other day and I, we were talking and I said, it's fun and bippida and she looked at me and she said, there, that still exists? Really? Yeah. Because the message is if you take folic acid, you won't have a child with spina bifida. So, we kind of got off the language part, but. Well, it's still, the, I mean, we're talking about disability, because it's not just about right. the language. We're talking about people and who right. they are. Right. And and trying to break down, like, in your class, you have students that say, oh, I've never seen more than a handful of, you know, people, people with, with disabilities uh -huh. in my entire life. And maybe it's because they aren't recognizing that, oh, yeah, John, who walks with a little bit of a limp, he has a disability, but you don't recognize that mm -hmm. because you think of him as a John. Mm -hmm. And for you, disability is like, oh, okay, this person is no longer able to function at the same level as mm -hmm. everyone else they mm -hmm. can't live their life normally mm -hmm. we don't want what it comes down to is we don't want to surround all of this stigma around mm -hmm. the idea of disability which i think goes back to these disability movements that you mm -hmm. talk about like mm -hmm. people are okay with who they are and they want who they are to be enough and they want to push it in your face right um, just like any other movement you know like the um, gay, lesbian, transgender movement, you know? I mean, that's really going on now and, uh, you know, the whole civil rights around those issues. Um, it's different, it's somewhat different with disability, but it's the same, you know, same in a lot of ways. We're not less than because, you know, we have a disability, although s in society people wouldn't, necessarily say that but they think it it's a bias that they've grown up with it's a stigma that's been there forever um, we're reading in my disability class Irving Goffman's um, uh, book called Stigma and that was written in 1963 and as a text for sociology and many of the issues are still very prevalent today I mean, yeah, we have curb cuts, we have parking spaces, we have ramps, but it's that's not just what it's about. Right. It's much deeper. Like in what ways? Because it goes down into what people actually believe about, you know, disability and is it a tragedy, you know, um, there were people. There were there were fights about the ADA. Why would somebody not support the ADA? I mean, I think on the w one side. I mean, you have to take everybody's perspective. Small businesses think you know think that um, it would take away their rights because you know they have to pay money to put in a ramp. But um, sometimes it's just an easy fix and. You know, and there are people with disabilities who go around and try to sue, but it's not the majority. So, you know, it's, I think it's important to take both sides, but it's going to take a while to catch up. So we need, we need the laws to protect us. And what's the goal ultimately? The goal is just to live in the world like everybody else. And have equal access like everybody and I think what taking that a step further is without having to change who I am right like get a job be able to get a job and not be discriminated against because you have a disability right and that's hard to 
hard to know if somebody's discriminating, you know? Mm-hmm. That's a hard one to, but. Yeah. So I guess I wanted to talk about that that quote you bring up in class. It It's not me that's disabled. It's the building or it's the environment. Mm-hmm. And so. <coughs> right. It's not. It, yeah, it's the social environment that is disabling. It's not, I'm not disabled. I mean, we all have a disability, but, you know, something that mm-hmm. nobody's normal. Right. We could go and talk about what's normal. But, but anyway, but it's, for me, it's like, um, for example, last year I had to wear a boot on my foot and I had to... I I couldn't walk across the other campus to get to my class, and I know they had these carts, and um, but they didn't run at 8:30 when I needed them to pick me up. So it became this big to do to to get them to pick me up, and they did. After you know, I mean, they did. I mean, one or two times I was left in the evening and I hobbled to my car. But, but you know, that's, it should be easier. Mm-hmm. That's, that was disabling me. I didn't feel disabled until I couldn't get the class. Right. So should I go in disability? I don't want to go in dis- disability. I want to do my class. So there's a way to do that. Right. So... Um, another thing that you often say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not disabled, you're just temporary able-bodied. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. Huh? <laughs> that's, um, that's from, I still can't think of, Irving Zola. He wrote, he wrote, he was a dis- disability activist and he has since, he, he started one of the, he was one of the first independent living centers in Boston. And anyway, but he liked to do that to turn it turn the turn the uh turn it around if somebody is calling us disabled then they're uh, call them temporarily able-bodied or momentarily able-bodied because you know you never know right and then everybody gets older yeah everybody gets older so you lose your hearing and then all of a sudden mm-hmm anything yeah. mm-hmm. vision walking yeah, and the, and at my generation, there's a lot of us, so we're going to need a lot of occupational therapists to be out there uh, working with us, supporting public policy to, you know, get more accessible buses and transit and ways to get around because we're not going to sit home. Right, we're going to be out there. So well, and the point is, like, okay, yeah, I may not be able to walk 200 yards consistently but that doesn't mean that once I get there Mm -hmm. there's not some things that I want to do or that it's not worth it for me to get to that point like I have my own interests I have my own Mm -hmm.